Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. If the current opinion polls are borne out, the Liberal Democrats won't be left with many MPs after the general election. If so, the country should pray that one of them is our first guest. He is that rare thing in the sea of mediocrity, a man of independent mind, and in the chamber where a shiver can sometimes be seen running along the green benches looking for a spine to run up. He is that rare thing. A man of courage. When the strange death of Dr. David Kelly occurred, the worst case of suicide you'll ever see, he didn't just call it a strange death, he wrote a book about it by the same name. He is the former Home Office Minister of State, Norman Baker, MP. Norman, thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. Let's talk uh, briefly about Parliament. Uh, first, the whole world is talking about the CIA torture report. President Obama tried very hard to stop it coming out. The British government appeared to have been busy trying to make sure that all references to our complicity in that matter uh, was removed. What is it about the era of Tony Blair, George Bush, that still haunts the current crop of leaders? Oh, there's a lot, I think, that haunts them and, and haunts me. It haunts me because at that point, Parliamentary democracy and democracy in the US, which we thought was secure, the written constitution and so on, was just swept away. Uh, and all sorts of procedures and practices were undertaken which were beyond democracy, and yet the system seemed incapable of stopping it. And uh, it showed me how fragile democracy was. And at the time, of course, of uh, 2003, we saw just how fragile the BBC was, forced into an apology in the case of uh, David Kelly, forced into apology for relying on one source when it turned out Alistair Campbell had uh, one source, or was it no sources, for his made-up dossiers. So it frightened me that democracy could be so fragile uh, and we have to find a way of reinstating uh, the backbone of democracy in our society. Now, you've written to the government, uh, of which you were very recently quite an important member, demanding the publication of the Chilcot Inquiry report. All these years, all these millions of pounds, hundreds, hundreds of hours of testimony, paperwork, a million documents. When are we going to see it? Well, I've written to John Chilcot, actually, but, I mean, John Chilcot you, seems... You, you insist the government is not in control in any way of the, the timing of this Well, release. I think that there are obviously discussions going on between John Chilcot and, say, the Cabinet Secretary, and uh, no doubt the Prime Minister and others are, have got a view on these matters. But uh, I'm quite clear, this is, this, is now, this is now becoming history. This is 2003. This is a long time ago. And it's absurd that after so many years we can't see this. And I think the British people are entitled to see this report before the general election to inform them as to how they're going to vote. And having it come out after the election is an insult to the British people. It is an outrage that the media is, by and large, uh, quiet about. As I said in the introduction, you wrote a book about the strange death of... Dr. David Kelly, you still think it's just as strange? Of course I do. And leaving aside what people think happened to David Kelly, let's just start with the basic facts. The man was found dead in mysterious circumstances. An inquest was begun by the Oxfordshire coroner. The inquest was then pulled by the Labour government at the time, by the, by the politicians. And there has been no inquest into that man's death. Now, I challenge anyone to defend the situation where someone dies in mysterious circumstances and there is no inquest into that man's death. How can that possibly be right? And whatever people think happened to him, even if they think it was suicide, it cannot be right that there's been no inquest. Why aren't the journalists in this country, the media, demanding an inquest? The man in question was at the centre of the Iraq story. I mean, you talked about uh, a concert, a storm. David Kelly was in the eye of the storm. Uh, and then, days later, he's found dead in the most mysterious 
circumstances. What was most mysterious about them? Well, if you listen to the doctors and the medical experts who uh, look at this very carefully, uh, they believe it's impossible for him to have died in, in the way that was described, uh, medically impossible. Uh, one person only died in 2003 from severing the ulnar, ulnar artery, which is a tiny artery, matchstick thickness in your wrist. Um, presumably that one person was David Kelly. But beyond that, of course, a Hutton inquiry, which was it's a joke, frankly, was set up to look into the circumstances. Of course, spent no time at all on that. And in spite it did spend time on David Kelly's death. He was con contradictory. Key witnesses were not called, uh, including the people who were in charge of the inquiry for the police, his best friend, my Pedersen, and so on, were not called. Instead, the whole Hutton inquiry was diverted onto the BBC and whether or not the BBC had behaved properly. It's an outrage that the whole Hutton inquiry was not about the government and about the death of one individual who did his best for this country, but about the BBC and the media. The rest of the media went along with it. Now that you're back on the back benches, are you going to pick this story up again? Well, it's still there, George, and, you know, I'll wait for... I think the next stage will have to be... There's so much evidence out there that, that questions the official version, mm. but no-one's interested very much in the mainstream media in that. So we'll have to wait, I think, for one of the key players to come forward before the media then rediscover the story. I can't spend my whole life on, on one story. There's other things to do in Parliament. You say the mainstream media, but when we announced you're coming on uh, the Sputnik, everybody immediately responded regarding the strange death of Dr. David Kelly. Well, the public at large, of course, uh, are, are, uh, are, are concerned as I am about the official version. They, they know the, there's something not quite right about that. But that's not, you know, the, the, the powers that be want to shut this down. Not all MPs, of course. I mean, MPs will talk to me privately and say, well, actually, we've got our concerns too, senior mm. MPs. Mm. But they don't want to say anything publicly. Mm -hmm. so it's too difficult to rock the boat. So many politicians, and you know this, George, because you're one of them, um, there's a circle of, of, of uh, activity and there's a safe segment. People operate in the safe segment. Sure. And if you want to go outside that safe segment, as I do and you do, uh, then people don't like it. No. Now, how does it feel to be back on the back benches? <laughs> how did it feel to be in government with the Tories? Well, I've spent my life fighting Tories, so uh, it was a curious marriage. But, you know, the funny thing about the Tories is because they are business orientated, they could see it as a contract. You know, they want to buy some double glazing. We are selling double glazing. If they want to get double glazing, they have to get it from us. And they sign a contract, and by and large, because they're business people, they stick to the contract. So it kind of worked in a fashion. I know I would say that in many ways it worked quite well. At the Department for Transport, where I was for three and a half years, he was quite collegiate. There weren't many policy differences. We both wanted to expand the railways and so on. So that was a very productive time. I got a lot done at the Department for Transport. I'm very you proud did. of my stuff. You did, yeah. Yeah. Department of Transport. But then you went into the belly of the beast. <laughs> the belly uh, of the beast, yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, you, you were working under Theresa May, herself a putative prime ministerial uh, candidate. How did you get on with her? Well, I got on better than the media would have you believe, as a matter of fact. Mm. I mean, on a personal level, I've got nothing against Theresa. Um, the, di the difficulty was that she didn't seem to want to accept we had a coalition government. She thought it was a Conservative government with a Lib Dem to be tolerated. That's not my view on matters. A bit like the thick of it. Do you remember that in the I thick do, of yeah. it? The, uh, yes. <laughs> how the Liberal Democrat, or one assumes they were the Liberal Democrat uh, coalition partner, were treated, uh, frankly, with contempt by the ministers and the special advisors to the ministers well i think it varied part. across government the department for transport was very good uh, and i had good relations with my tory colleagues and indeed with the tory special advisors in the in the dft and the relations with theresa were on a personal level quite amicable uh, she sent me a christmas card last week um but you know she it was sends that to all the guys well maybe she does she sent me a christmas card last <laughs> she, week. oh well there you are i'll, 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 wipe, that, I'll wipe that from my uh, my argument no seriously uh, we're now in the run-up to the election but not so close that we can't talk about it i mean frankly in your constituency a progressive person would be mad to vote against you even though there's a labor candidate there's even a green candidate any progressive person should say well he might be a liberal democrat but he's our kind of liberal democrat he's a real uh, liberal democrat but not all of your colleagues are in the same boat according to the opinion polls you may be about to lose half your MPs. Is there a kind of uh, gallows humour amongst your ranks about that? No, I mean, I think we, we, we know we're facing a difficult election, but that doesn't mean there's a, a gallows humour or indeed a pessimism about it. I mean, I think we're well dug in in many of our seats, and I think we'll do much better than the press expects. Although the, the poll indicated oh, well, that the... you're going to do worse in the seats you hold than you are well, in the I, national I don't poll. believe that, George. Believe I, you know, I know the inside where we're going. I don't believe that. And the, the reality is that... You know, every single parliament I've been involved in, and before I was in parliament, the press loved to write stories about how the Lib Dems have finished. They've been written at so many
plenty of times, you know, that you get a repeat fee for these stories right between every every election. You know, we're not finished. Liberalism doesn't die. Liberalism is an idea that cannot die uh, because it's there in the British people. So it will carry on. And uh, we'll, do, we'll do better than people expect, as we always do. But you've got to bear in mind that the people who are saying that we're finished, who are they? They're off from the right-wing press who can't bear the fact that we're in, we're in there stopping the Tories doing what they want to do. Or that the far left-wing press who want Labour to have a clear run. You know, the press, by and large, want to return to a two-party system. They don't want the Greens, they don't want Lib Dems, they don't want SNP. They want Labour versus Tory. That's what they want. Well, the British people don't want that because over the years um, you've seen the, the combination of the, the percentage of the vote for Labour and Tory decline from, I think, 98% in 1995. It was 98% when down, I was born. Down, the, to, in... down to what? 60% it, or yeah. something? Now. So, you know, British people are fed up with Tea Party It'll be politics. 50 something uh, well. percent. At the and, and the press had better catch up with the public. Yes, but Nick Clegg made a fateful decision. Uh, your party did to climb into the ministerial Montegos and keep David Cameron in power, the Bullingdon boy, the Etonian posh boy, and a multi millionaire government. Uh, the pledge on student fees and so on. It's going to hurt you very badly. Well, look, I have a few things about that. First of all, I, there's no Ministry of Montego. I refuse to have a, a ministerial car. Uh, and I uh, had a big argument We've with the We've already Hillbox. accepted that you're a different I, I got a whole office bike, just for the record. <laughs> a bicycle. Um, but look, I mean, if we had not got into... The arithmetic at the last election said you can have a Tory minority government or you can have a Tory Lib Dem coalition. That's what the arithmetic said. There wasn't, there wasn't another option on the table. And we thought if we let the Tories have a minority government, they'll run to the country six months' time and get a majority. That's what happens in these situations. It happened in 74 with Harold Wilson. Uh, and if we, uh, go in with the co if we don't go with the coalition, people will say, you wanted the balance of power for 50 years, you've been given it, you're doing nothing with it. So we had a very difficult choice. We made the right choice, I think, both for the country and indeed for us. It was a difficult choice and it wasn't an easy choice to make out of the two options. But in terms of the manifesto, we've delivered 75% of our manifesto in government. Uh, I'm very pleased about that. OK, we didn't deliver tuition fees, and that was a, a, a very painful thing for me and for a number of our colleagues. But, you know, the reality was when it came to negotiations with the Tories and Labour after the election, both Tories and Labour said, we want tuition fees up. Both the other parties are going to increase tuition fees. So there's nobody to negotiate with that on that well, issue. if it happens again, I hope you make a different choice. Norman Baker, thanks very much thanks. for being on. The interview. Coming up after the break, cash strap Britain has found a hidden stash last week. At least we must assume so, because permanent new military bases in the Persian Gulf don't come cheap. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Britain withdrew east of Suez back in 1971. But just when you thought our economy couldn't get much worse, We've pulled a rabbit out of the hat and announced we are to build a new permanent military base in the Persian Gulf, and not just anywhere, in Bahrain. Bahrain is in the grip of a revolution. It has an absolute royal dictatorship which murders and tortures democracy campaigners and then incarcerates doctors who treat those campaigners. And if that weren't bad enough, Bahrain is also occupied by invitation by its even more brutal dictatorship of a neighbour, Saudi Arabia. On board the Sputnik with us to discuss what all this means is Charles Shoebridge, a man who knows what he's talking about, a former army officer, intelligence man and security expert. Charles, what has Bahrain got that Britain would want to build a military base there? Bahrain has many things, of course, that Britain has got, one of which is money, for sure, and the other is a geographical location which is uh, at least a justification from a geopolitical perspective. It's, um, of course, uh, something... Is the clue in the word Persian Gulf? The clue is in the word Persian Gulf. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, uh, its importance with respect to oil imports, <clears throat> with respect to uh, the movement of free trade and shipping. And, of course, also, uh, it's an opportunity for Britain to show uh, that it's a very close ally, of course, of the United States, who has a very significant presence already in Bahrain. Their fifth fleet is already it's uh, a birth there. Exactly. Uh, I, I can see that, but I thought that we were shivering through austerity winter. What? I thought that Britain was cash-strapped. A permanent military base doesn't sound like a cheap thing to me. 
Having said that, I think, uh, first of all, Bahrain is paying for this, which um, at least they're paying for the capital costs. So they've put, they're going to invest something like £15 million, pounds, $23, $24 million in this. Britain will then um, take the running costs of this. But um, that, I think, tells us a lot in itself as to why a country like Bahrain would want to actually give a base to a foreign power. Um, and it's also, I think, uh, a point that this is actually quite, I think, more of a symbolic gesture uh, or of symbolic importance than it is of any practical effect. I say this for a number of reasons. First of all, because £15 million, which is being paid by Bahrain, even though we're going to pay the operating costs uh, into the future, um, it's a lot of money to you and me, but in terms of uh, the big picture of defence spending, defence equipment, defence infrastructure, £15 million does not buy you an awful lot. Um, secondly, um, we've already got use of the American facilities there. No doubt we make some sort of contribution or perhaps as a quid pro quo they can use our facilities as we know that happens. Um, uh, and it's also the case that, of course, even though we haven't been based permanently in the Persian Gulf since the early 70s at, at, at least, um, we have had quite a, a near permanent naval presence in terms of ships patrolling and, and things like this. And so consequently, this is really very, um, I think, symbolic. And it's very symbolically important, I think, both for Britain and particularly, of course, for Bahrain. I think this is an attempt, if you like, or an opportunity seized by the Bahraini uh, ruling family, because it is a ruling family, a dictatorship by any other name. It is um, an attempt, I think, to tie other European powers into Bahrain. It's an attempt to say, um, if America were at some future point to start signalling its withdrawal from the Persian Gulf, I mean, let's face it, there are a number of uh, factors here. First of all, there are uh, increasingly, uh, let's not put too strong a word on it, but good relations uh, or better relations with Iran uh, from America. There's a resolution, hopefully, of the nuclear uh, issue. Uh, there is perhaps um, a cooperation in the future against ISIS and others. So, of course, this is uh, a matter of some fear for people uh, like the Saudi and the Bahraini ruling families. Secondly, American dependence on um, uh, Arabian oil is declining. Declining sharply, yeah. Thirdly, mm -hmm. and lastly, I would say that America is increasingly focusing elsewhere in the Pacific, where it sees its, its main rivalry. Pivot to Asia. Exactly, because mm. of what it sees as the China threat or rivalry, whatever it wants to see. And therefore, I think Bahrain is perhaps slightly, I wouldn't put it any stronger than this, but slightly perhaps apprehensive that the more... Uh, this happens, the more direction of travel is America is away from this area, the more it should go back to its old friends. Britain, of course, was the, uh, gave the protectorate for many, many years, uh, was the colonial master, if you like. Um, and therefore, it doesn't hurt them at all to have Britain, uh, if you like, with its footprint back in. And from one, I said it was symbolically important, but there's a practical issue here as well, which I don't think has been mentioned elsewhere as far as I've seen. If we have a naval base there, a naval facility, I think base is probably too strong a word for it, um, at the moment with 15 million pounds but if we have a naval facility there would that possibly in the future were there to be disorder chaos revolution as some might call it uh, protest would that give Britain an opportunity to deploy troops there to protect the base nominally but of course that would also be very useful and helpful for uh, the ruling family well you're not old enough to remember but the last time we were in that region roaming around the streets quelling disorder. It was in the Crater district in Aden uh, with the bagpipes skirling and kilts swaying as we shot down the natives. That symbolically was seen as the last act of the British Empire. It was the moment when Harold Wilson declared we were withdrawing east of Suez. And indeed, it's, this is why, again, as a symbol, it's almost a reversal of that position. <clears throat> no matter that it's not in financial terms, a vast sum of money. It does symbolically tie us in there because it means then that we're not just piggybacking on the American facilities that we do now. It means now that, uh, that uh, we can send a signal that says we are four square with the Bahraini, with Bahrain, as the Foreign Secretary said the other day. We are standing shoulder to shoulder with Bahrain. What he really meant, of course, was that we're standing shoulder to shoulder with the Bahraini ruling family because, as we know, of course, uh, if uh, this was the same in Syria, let's say, the Russian naval base in, Sy in Syria. This has been roundly criticised by Labour and Conservative, Liberal Democrat, all politicians in the US and the UK. And yet there we are now doing exactly the same thing in a position which, in a situation which, although there's no uh, full-blown civil war in Bahrain at the moment, there's still nonetheless an active protest group. There is um, uh, a... Uh, what, some might say an insurgency, a rebel organisation, people who actually say that they want democracy, which is actually very different from much of the Syrian situation. And yet we are saying 
we will do exactly what Russia does in um, Syria and something that we have criticised Russia for, for having that naval base in Syria. It sends a very clear message of two things, I think. First of all, that we are tying ourselves to uh, these um, dictatorships such as Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar and others. Uh, but also, I think it sends a very clear message, unfortunately, that Britain, at least in respect of its foreign policy with regards to this area, uh, shows quite a degree of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy? Us? <laughs> <laughs> It's been heard before, for sure. This week in Channel 4, <coughs> they uh, aired this program on dismantling Camp Bastion. Mm. Don't you think it's a bit ironic, as, the, as Britain is dismantling its largest overseas base since the Second World War, and now opening this new naval base? Is that maybe the arithmetic uh, that, you, that you raised in the beginning? It's an uh, interesting point, although um, the, um, uh, that was a very interesting documentary, which luckily I've seen since you've raised it. Um, uh, that was something like over a billion pounds that cost us. And again, that brings into uh, relief what I've just said about this 15 million uh, as, a, as a, almost like a, a symbol only for um, our relationship with Bahrain. Very interesting in that programme. I, I would urge people to try and watch that programme on Channel 4. Um, if I'm allowed to put other <laughs> TV broadcasters uh, as an advertisement almost. Because what comes through clearly again and again, perhaps un unintentionally I found on that programme, was when they are translating what the senior Afghan generals are saying, and this is unbeknown to the British generals or colonels who are sitting there, the sheer disdain that so many of the Afghan senior officers seem to have for their British counterparts. Um, that came through very uh, clearly and probably quite unintentionally. Charles, as we've got you here, and you're an expert in the intelligence field, rectal infusions, prolapses, ice baths, standing for 66 hours, people dying on the torture tables, all of that turns out to have been the practice of our closest ally, the United States and its intelligence services, the CIA, according to the report this week. Did any of that shock or surprise you? Uh, very sadly, no, it didn't surprise me at all. And the reason I say that is because it's largely been in the public domain for some time, well over a decade. I mean, it's 2004 was the earliest that I could find that I'd mentioned these practices going on, particularly in respect of the UK's role in suspected uh, rendition, going back to uh, 2004 is when I, I think, first mentioned it. So if I know about it, and I'm not even involved on the inside of these uh, issues anymore, uh, and The Guardian and other newspapers were reporting or at least referring to it, it's been, um, if you like, common knowledge. And that's why I gave a slightly wry smile when David Cameron, uh, the, uh, on the day of the report, came out and said something like that the uh, United States risked losing its moral authority through its use of torture. And yet, throughout the whole time that that torture was taking place, uh, politicians of all shades in the United Kingdom um, uh, spoke only really of uh, shared values. Uh, and it turns out that those shared values, as was widely suspected, were of torture uh, and so on. And also, let's not forget, there is a long history of American and, sadly, British involvement in torture, if only, uh, not only with their own security forces to varying degrees, um, and I wouldn't want to overemphasize that, but also, of course, in their um, uh, complicity with the torture by other regimes around the world. For example, if we look at countries such as Saudi Arabia uh, and so on, torture is widely practiced in these places. And so um, not much is said uh, by the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, about these, these practices. And so therefore, perhaps it's not surprising that then they uh, use these practices themselves. But of course, the fact that the CIA have been blamed now for lying, and undoubtedly they did lie to their oversight, it, it raises two issues for me. It's first of all, does it suggest, therefore, that what the CIA have told uh, their oversight committees and so on in respect of their other activities, for example, in Syria, in Libya, were also lies, and maybe this should all be revisited. And secondly, the fact that you've got the CIA being blamed for lying, it's almost the same as happened in the, uh, the UK uh, with respect to the reasons for going to war in 2003 in Iraq, that it really does give an excuse for uh, the politicians, the journalists, all of whom who didn't question this torture when it was happening, to say, oh, but we were deceived, the CIA yeah. lied to us. What are we supposed to do? Yeah. Notwithstanding that really for over a decade it's been common knowledge. They're all shocked, shocked in the way that the police captain in Casablanca was when discovering there was gambling going on <laughs> at Rick's Cafe. Thank you very much indeed, Charles Shoebridge. <laughs> and now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, it seems that for the public, Norman Baker is synonym, synonym to the strange death of 
Dr. David Kelly. I got the impression he doesn't quite like that. Uh, I think he's a bit worried that he'll be pigeonholed in that way. Yeah. But nonetheless, he was the man who had the courage to say what he thought and write a book about it. And people respect him for that. So that's why Mohammed F. Mia says, I can openly say without an iota of fear that Dr. David Kelly was murdered by British and American licenses. I also say this, you can kill a man, but you can't kill the truth. On the torture report, it's unbelievable, but believable. As you know, Dick Cheney commented um, that it is full of crap. Yeah, he said he'd do it all again. <laughs> mm. Unbelievable, uh, but believable. LBC responds, one of them is full of and it isn't the torture report, so it must be Dick. And L Twitterer says, the crap is that any other regime would be at the ICC for crimes against humanity. No chance of that for Blair and Bush. And that's all that we've got time for this Which, week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can keep in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.